ตัดท่านเราอยู่จีมแต่ไม่ใช่ปางตัวเราก็ตัดท่านเราอยู่จีมเราหนูก็ตัวอยู่ไม่ใช่ตัดเท่ากี่เราใช้สูตรใช่
Um, so we will carry on from our reading of Shantideva's text, chapter 9, um, <coughs> we are on uh, verse 2, uh, where we read that this truth is recognized as being of two kinds, conventional and ultimate. And then Shantideva goes on to write, ultimate reality is, the, is beyond the scope of the intellect. The intellect is called conventional reality. So we already spoke about how we can understand the two levels of the truth in terms of the facts that are affirmed and found by a conventional mode of understanding and the more ultimate mode of understanding. So corresponding to these two levels of understanding with respect to reality, one can talk about two levels of truth. <clears throat> and then um, the text goes on to write, in the light of this, people are seen to be of two types, the contemplative or the yogi and the ordinary person. So um, the reference, um, the point being made here is that among individuals, there will be different types and the distinctions are drawn on the basis of the level of sophistication in their understanding of reality. So comparatively, for example, we can talk about ordinary people, beings, and the more contemplative on the basis of those who, for example, um, are concerned only about everyday life and their understanding of the events around them are more at this very gross everyday engagement with the world. So we can call that perspective an ordinary perspective and contrast that with those individuals who are more reflective, whose understanding and engagement with the world may include you know, the concepts about what happens after the, life, after the death, the concept of rebirth and so on. So, and those who tend to take more reflective kind of you know, approach to their own internal mental states and so on. So comparatively, we can call one group of people more contemplative or yogi, the other kind of more ordinary. So even within the ordinary perspective, we can find differences, again, comparatively. For example, if you compare the scientist to average ordinary person, then again, we can say that the scientists tend to have a perspective that is not satisfied only with a mere superficial perception of the world. They would inquire deeper into what constitutes reality over and above, beyond the level of perception, beyond the level of everyday appearance. So again, within that context, we can say the scientists represent more the yogi or contemplative perspective and the average ordinary person as representing the ordinary perspective. And the Tibetan term for yogi is neljor, and neljor literally means connecting your mind to a more settled facts of things. So in that sense, that, that etymology can also apply to the scientific perspective, which tends to relate to reality at a more deeper level. So in any case here, in this text, the distinction between the yogi and the ordinary perspective is really made on the basis of whether or not one's perspective is only confined to this world, this life, or whether the perspective includes something beyond the boundaries of this life, such as concept of rebirth and so on. So, um, and also uh, within, um, so, so ordinary people, for example, when we relate to the world, we tend to relate on the level of you know, everyday uh, perspective. So for example, when we see this flower today, which we have seen yesterday, instinctively we tend to think, this is the same flower I saw yesterday. So on that gross level, we can use that kind of language, but if you go beyond that and analyze, then actually this is, in, in a strict sense, this is not the same flower because the flower being a conditioned phenomenon is momentarily changing. 
So the flower, the yesterday's flower is no longer here, but on an ordinary kind of naive perspective, we tend to relate, you know, take this flower to be the same flower, because what is happening is that we relate to this flower through the medium of the concept of flower, which conflates time, and we tend to, you know, you know bring, make, mix the two times together and turn it into one entity. But, so that's the ordinary perspective, whereas the yogic perspective tends to look more at a deeper level of the actual reality. So within the yogis, again, depending upon how profound your understanding of the nature of reality, that perspective is going to be more advanced compared to other perspectives that are less deeper in their engagement with the reality. So even within the yogic perspective, contemplative perspective, there can be different levels. So therefore we read um, in Shantideva's text, he says, in the light of this, people are seen to be of two types, the contemplative and the ordinary person. The ordinary folks are superseded by the contemplatives. And then he goes on, due to the difference in their intelligence, even contemplatives are refuted by successively higher ones by means of analogies accepted by both parties. And the point being made here is that when two perspectives come into you know, contact with each other and debate about a certain facts of reality, they, that, that kind of discourse takes place on the basis of certain shared premises, and you also use examples that are you know, accepted by both parties, and on that basis, the discourse takes place. So with this, <clears throat> um, I just wanted to read that section of Shantideva's chapter to provide an overall introduction to the overall framework of the Buddhist path. Mm -hmm. はい、だ。だじゃな。うん。ああ。だけなんだ。なんしゅぎ。え。シザルで。ちょっとね、ごまごま3 だ、だばしてかるそんぶれしたな。だ、とめだばくじょだばしにきんでち。え、ね、ごべだばらじゃだばしに。きんで。さばちくちゃ、とそんで。ただがた、あ、てしんごれだばしとて、しんごべねち
Tanti ciò che si dice da me, no? Buddhist science, uh, and Buddhist philosophy, or Buddhist concept, and Buddhist religion. So, <clears throat> the, the, the foundation of the Buddha's teaching uh, are really uh, embodied in the teachings of the Four Noble Truths. And um, so this is the Four Noble Truths where Buddha presents, in fact, two sets of cause and effect relations. So you have the suffering and its origin, one set of cause and effect, a cessation and the path, another set of cause and effects. And when, if you look at the, the Buddha's actual sermon on the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha taught Four Noble Truths by means of three repetitions or three cycles. One was um, the, <clears throat> the presentation of the truth themselves. So where Buddha states that this is, uh, is the truth of suffering, this is the truth of the origin of suffering, and so on. So at that level, you know, Buddha is presenting the nature of reality. <clears throat> and, um, you know, and then the second uh, round of presentation where Buddha says that suffering must be recognized and the origin of suffering must be eliminated and the cessation must be actualized and the path must be cultivated. So here, Buddha is presenting now um, the function <coughs> of these knowledge of the Four Noble Truths and how one should implement that knowledge into one's actual practice. So in other words, in this second round of repetition presentation, Buddha is presenting <coughs> the, the procedure on the path. And uh, so in the third round of presentation, when the Buddha says that uh, although suffering must be known, recognized, but there is no suffering to be recognized, although the origin must be eliminated, there is no origin to be eliminated, and so on. So in this <coughs> um, uh, round of presentation, Buddha is presenting the actual uh, results or fruits of internalizing the knowledge of the Four Noble Truths and implementing them into their proper functions. So here, the, 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 the fruit of the knowledge of the Four Noble Truths and the implementation is the <coughs> uh, realization of the wisdom of um, uh, cessation and also uh, non-arising. Now this refers to the cessation of the suffering and non-arising of suffering anymore. And uh, so in, in commenting upon this uh, fruits of the uh, internalization of the knowledge of the Four Noble Truths, uh, Nagarjuna in his precious garland explains that to fully understand the meaning of cessation and also non-arising of potential suffering, uh, one must understand it in terms of the, the teaching on emptiness, the emptiness of inherent existence. And, <clears throat> and, and the reason for that is because when we talk about the cessation of suffering, we are also talking about the cessation of the roots of suffering. And the root of suffering is this distorted state of mind. Uh, and the question is, in what sense the root of the suffering is distorted? It is distorted in relation to the actual nature of reality. So since the root of suffering is a distorted state of mind uh, with relation to the actual nature of reality, it is a state of mind that can be eliminated and the cessation of that can be actualized. So, and since it is distorted in relation to the ultimate nature of reality, it, by cultivating the wisdom that understands the ultimate nature of reality, one can eliminate it. And that content of that ultimate nature of reality, uh, wisdom, is, is the emptiness. So therefore, in you know, order to fully understand the meaning of cessation and the wisdom of non-arising, uh, Nagarjuna points out that one needs to understand the, the teaching on the emptiness of inherent existence. So one can therefore look at the teachings of the Four Noble Truths in terms of presenting the ground, which is the nature of reality, the path, and then the fruits or results of that path. And another way of looking at this is also, as I normally often point out, within the Buddhist teachings, you have three key elements. One element that relates to the natural reality, we can call that the Buddhist science. And then based upon that understanding of reality, there is the second dimension, which is the dimension of Buddhist philosophy. 
and Buddhist concepts, and based upon these two, there are the Buddhist practices, and, and therefore we can call that third dimension Buddhist spirituality or Buddhist religion. <clears throat> Uh, I think when we talk about Buddhist science, the external matters, <clears throat> one category, then internal matters, there's another category. So internal uh, matter means now, matter or internal thing means the mind or emotions, or these are, um, these are the point. So modern science, uh, up to now, well, so far, mainly focusing external matters, a cosmology, uh, a, a particle, physics, a physics, uh, these things, and perhaps brain and the Kasati magician. Neurons. Neuroscience. Neurons. Neurons. Neuroscience. That may be. Listen, you put out some chance or something. So we can look at the brain science as almost a kind of a, an interface between the matter, material world and the mental, the inner world. So that lead now the uh, interest or importance of the knowledge of emotion of mind. So emotions or minds uh, make differences in the brain sort of uh, activities. Uh, activities, no. Brain activities. On the other hand, uh, again, the brain activities change the certain emotions also succumb. So into something very inter interrelated. Uh, so as far as internal sort of sciences or science of or the mind is concerned, uh, ancient Indian thought is quite rich, including Buddhism. Uh, so the combination, modern science and ancient Indian inner science, it seems very useful to understand the reality. To Buddhist, the modern scientific findings is very, very helpful. So now some of our classical sort of view about the world, physical world, flat, at the center, Mount Miru, all these now old-fashioned, outdated. Uh, that is okay, no problem. Even the uh, reserve unit, the reserve the tower tower jog him to um, in fact, so, so actually when it comes to the uh, description of Mount Meru and the uh, explanation of the cosmology, um, whether or not this Mount Meru exists really have, will have no implications when it comes to the path to enlightenment and, and attainment of liberation. Um, and even on, with relation to topics that are very important and directly relevant to this quest for liberation, such as the Four Noble Truths, even there, um, due to the diversity in the mental dispositions of the practitioners, Buddha himself has taught differently. Tibet said six to one. Tibet said Sanskrit six to. Nice. 
저성의 힌두 간데 베지드 나라리 엔신 베지드 나라리야 베드 베지 숨져 숨은 날 찍이우라. 맞아. He s o l e n t was saying that he was told there. 저성 안주 안데 디페트 세 찍도와 디텐데 상스가 찍이네 솔레샤 디세브샤도. 아난 하사 세시도와 디 디튼규르체나 하이유 세치 베지르샤디. So, uh, um, so this reminds. Uh, um, so this reminds me of uh, 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 an observation which in, an Indian uh, scholar made, that the, with reference to the term Tibet, and uh, uh, the, his suggestion was that this is a kind of a um, uh, derivative. Of a Sanskrit term which refers to this heavenly the pronunciation, pronunciation very similar, very similar, yeah. 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 and uh, refers to the this one of the heavenly realms. So maybe it was uh, early Indian masters uh, imagining Tibet to be a heavenly realm, and also the Lhasa, the capital Lhasa, which means the land of uh, the ground of the devas, the celestial beings, may also be related to that concept. So the Mount Kailash, the Shivaji sort of residence. So in heaven, Shivaji also be here. Then Raja Monju, he had a picture there. So in that view, Shivaji also be young so that. Hello. Hello. So uh, earlier, Solent was saying that uh, so we Tibetans actually came from this heavenly realm. Um, So in that sense, then um, Mount Kailash, which is really um, believed by the you know cl- traditional Hindus as the being the physical abode of uh, you know the god Shiva, so then the realm, the Tibetan realm, would be part of that heavenly realm. But uh, unfortunately, the people from this heavenly realm is right now going through a tough time. <laughs> so sometimes I jokingly was telling my Indian friend. Buddha Shakyamuni, Buddhist lord, uh, come from traditionally come from India. Now today's is a political map, uh, Lumbini in Nepal. So some Nepalese say Buddha Shakyamuni was Nepalese, Nepalese. not Indian, <laughs> but that, that's uh, not important. So in any way, the traditionally you see, we consider Buddha Shakyamuni as an Indian. Uh, then the Hindus. Is it the Lord, Lord Shiva, Lord Shivaji? Lord Shivaji's permanent residence in Tibet, in Mount Kailash. So, from that viewpoint, Lord Shivaji is Tibetan. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hindu guru or Lord is Tibetan. Tibetan guru or Lord Indian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so now, about inner science, not mind. Uh, now that mind, uh, from the viewpoint of law of causality, action comes from motivation. Motivation means mind. So, from that viewpoint, uh, so, um, so this relates to a citation from um, Chantakirti's text, "Entering the Middle Way," where he says that uh, it is the mind that creates the diversity, diverse world systems, and as well as the beings within, sentient beings within them. So then, further investigation: What's mind? Now, more detailed explanation. Uh, firstly, mind. Uh, very nature of mind is neutral. Not uh, constructive or destructive. Not inflammatory emotion. Nature. Takada lumodena chakshikura. 
So the essential, the mind itself, is actually a neutral phenomenon. So within the realm that we call domain, that we call the mental domain, uh, we can see many different levels of subtlety. For example, on the gross level of everyday experience, then, you know, much of our experience of mind takes place on the level of the senses. So they are dependent upon some objective conditions that it perceives, and also they're dependent upon the actual physical sense organs that support the, these mental states. But if you go deeper, more at the level of the mental consciousness, then the mental consciousness there, it's arising and, and condition you can only think, you can think mainly in terms of its own successive continuum of an awareness. Uh, Alam <laughs> Negososos Rashid Rabo so, so if we were to examine our own experiences of mind, the mental domain, uh, we can already kind of um, 
uh, observe degrees of subtlety. For example, the, 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 the various mental states during the waking period is much more gross compared to the experiences of the mind during the dream state. And so already there is a comparatively subtler states of consciousness when you are dreaming. And again, even in dream, when you have a clear dream, you already are experiencing some form of perception, although the content of that perception may be just mental objects, it's not external objects, but there's still there is a cognitive activity going on. But if you compare that state to a deep sleep state, again, the deep sleep, the consciousness at the time of deep sleep is even more subtler. So we can see how progressively in our own everyday experience, we can experience these different levels of subtlety. And um, so, now, this, um, so, so in terms of the explanation of the different levels of subtlety, um, we can uh, find much more kind of uh, uh, richer explanation of these in, uh, in the highest yoga tantra literature. And to use particularly the terminology of Guha Samanja, uh, there are explanations of different levels of progressively subtler levels of consciousness. For example, uh, uh, Guha Samanja Tantra speaks of the four levels of emptied states. And progressively, these are stages where the grosser levels of activity comes to be dissolved. And, and progressively, the mind becomes subtler and subtler. So, and, uh, so when one experiences at the final most subtle state of consciousness, one has already transcended all the levels of, uh, uh, which can be afflicted. So although the subtle level of mind itself is neutral, but due to yogic uh, applications or practices, it can be turned into a virtuous state. But however, at that very subtle state of consciousness, the various afflictions of the mind cannot arise because the afflictions, for them to arise, the mind needs to be already fairly on the gross level. So once you attain the subtle levels of consciousness, uh, in, for example, you know, at the subtle level which is experienced when the various 80 indicative uh, conceptions, conceptions indicative of different stages, have already come to cease, then afflictions can, afflictions can no longer arise. However, that subtle continuity of consciousness still carries on. And in fact, it is this very subtle level of consciousness that makes all our cognitive experiences possible and all our cognitive experiences to have that subjective quality of knowing and luminosity. It is actually this subtle stream of awareness that makes it possible. So, um, so from, that, from the point of view of that subtle level, subtle most level of consciousness, then there is no beginning, nor there is any end. And in fact, it is referred to as the ever-present awareness, and it is also referred to as the innate mind. It's kind of an innate quality that we possess. And, and so, for, so it, is neither, it neither has beginning nor an end. And this morning we spoke about the question of whether there is a beginning or end to the self. And so this subtle level of consciousness is, in the final analysis, the basis upon which we designate the notion of I or self. So, since this is the basis, therefore, the self continuity of the self uh, has no beginning nor an end. And, and sorry, and and so it is, uh, it is this subtle uh, consciousness um, and the the emptiness of that subtle consciousness, which uh, both of which um, retain their continuum, e even at the stage of Buddhahood. Therefore, this subtle level of consciousness and its emptiness are uh, understood as to be the Buddha nature, the Tathagata Garbha, the essence of Buddhahood. Jajangata, Dishinimbu Sudha, Tadiku Shili Yodavachi, Shi Nezuche. Right. 
So therefore, when we talk about the Buddha nature in the Buddhist context, we are talking about a reality that is already there, that is uh, that is present in in the nature. And um, similarly, um, these the subtle you know level of consciousness it is a, a conditioned phenomena. Therefore, it is a phenomena that arises in on the basis of causes and condition. And this fact of its dependence upon causes and conditions is also uh, again, its nature of reality. It's part of the nature of reality. concept <laughs> Tending <laughs> So, so it is so when we uh, understand the nature of reality in those terms, these are we're talking about facts which are part of the nature of reality. And here we can refer to these facts as part of the Buddhist science. And based upon this, then we can, for example, although the fact that all phenomena are devoid of inherent existence is part of the nature of reality, but when we uh, uh, you know, examine the way in which we tend to perceive phenomena, we come to recognize that we tend to perceive phenomena as if they possess some kind of intrinsic objective existence. So the manner, although the reality is that phenomena are empty and, and devoid of inherent existence, but we perceive them to possess some kind of inherent objective existence. And this then, um, you know, um, opens up the possibility of recognizing that our perception of the reality is grounded in a form of a distortion and because it, this distortion lies at the root of our afflictions and therefore this, the, the afflictions, the, the, the pollutants of the mind can be removed because they are all rooted in a distortion and so these kind of reflections then involve what one could call Buddhist philosophy so, and, and points towards the possibility of attaining cessation. So although cessation is not an integral part of reality already existing in us, but because it is intimately connected with the understanding of the ultimate nature of reality, which is, which is already there, so the, 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 the concept of cessation, which is part of Buddhist philosophy, is actually intimately tied to the Buddhist understanding of the nature of reality. So. No. Hmm? Uh, sorry, and then, so this this understanding of cessation would also involve not only a recognition that the, the root of the afflictions is distorted, therefore it is removable, but also an awareness that the essential nature of mind is clear light, that it is not penetrated by these pollutants. So on the basis of these two, one comes to recognize the possibility of a, a true cessation. So so it is this kind of development of Buddhist philosophy and concept based on the Buddhist science that um, um, kind of, you know, um, 
um, leads to the understanding of the Buddhist, you know, uh, uh, aspiration, the aims of the Buddhist aspiration. These are attainment of liberation, uh, freedom from sickly existence, and the attainment of the Buddha, omniscient mind of the Buddha, omniscient, omniscient Buddhahood. And so given these are our objectives and aims, then the path uh, towards that comes into being. And the path, uh, as we read from Kamala Shila's text, were you know, constituted primarily by three key elements, these being um, the awakening, sorry, compassion, and the awakening mind, bodhicitta, and then what is referred to as the skillf skillful in the means, uh, in other words, the wisdom of emptiness. Now here it becomes quite clear, the differences. Uh, the Tuesday religion comes from God, the true human being. So not much relevant about the today's so the reality, reality of this stage. The non Tuesday religion, particularly Buddhism, is a start from this moment and transform our mind and finally become Buddha. So therefore, uh, in order to build all these concepts, all these sort of paths based on today's reality. So Buddhist science is something important. Equally it is important to know these things. Then, with full of knowledge, the whole sort of structure or system of the Buddha Dharma, then they practice you know, such as you know, recitation of Om Mani Padme Hum. With the full of knowledge, and they recite certain effect, and then much effective. But without knowing these sort of structure, and then just recite a Mani Padme Hum without knowing the meaning, without knowing the structure, not much, not much effective. So therefore, the, in order to carry Buddhist practice, knowledge is extremely important. So, the uh, study of Buddha Dharma is very, very essential. So that's why uh, Buddha's own word, at least the word which translated into Tibetan, uh, about 100 volumes. So we believe much more not translated. So uh, if you see the uh, Buddhist practice simply faith and they recite Buddha's name, then no need such sort of elaborate way, elaborate explanation. Then furthermore, commentary, at least commentary by those Indian Buddhist masters, particularly the Nalanda masters, the translation which in, in, into Tibetan, about 220, over 220 volumes. So these also, the most cases, of course, some portion like history or some poetic like that. But most cases, explanation. And explanation also, occasionally taking the quotation of Buddha, Buddha's word, but most cases through reasoning. So therefore, in Buddhist tradition, logic becomes very, very essential. Like Chandrakshita, who introduced Buddhism in Tibet, and his disciple Kamala Shila, all these great logician, philosopher as well as a great logician. So 
the proper Buddhist practices, way of Buddhist practices, utilize human intelligence in a maximum way, through that way, transform our emotion and become a better person, happier person. Then from the Buddhist viewpoint, then not only, firstly, achieve happy life, a happy this life. That is a foundation, that's a guarantee for happy life. In the future. After the future lives also. Through that way, then eventually reach uh, nirvana, nirvana. Huh? or moksha, or salvation, or finally Buddhahood. So, that's it. This is the other. So now we will read from <coughs> Kamala Sheila's text um, and we are on page 43 where um, Kamala Shila writes in the second paragraph, he says, uh, he says that, um, um, therefore, since compassion is the only root of omniscience, you should become familiar with this practice from the very beginning. Then in the next para we read, and then he cites from a sutra, the compendium of perfect Dharma reads, O oh, Buddha and Bodhisattvas should not train in many practices, if a Bodhisattva properly holds on to one Dharma and learns it perfectly, he has all the Buddha's qualities in the palm of his hand. And if you ask what that one Dharma is, it is great compassion. <coughs> Just <laughs> So, in a way, I was just talking about the importance of studying and having a more comprehensive understanding of the Buddhist path, and then it may seem what I read from the text kind of contradicts it when it says that you only need to, you know, take uh, hold on to compassion. So, this has to be understood in its proper context. So, for example, uh, when we do the sadhana on Avalokiteshvara and we recite the mantra, mantra the six syllable mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum, and at the end, when we dedicate, we say, May through the virtue of this uh, sadhana practice, may I attain the state of Avalokiteshvara and lead all beings to that state. Uh, of course, um, the, the suggestion here is not that simply by doing this, we are going to attain Avalokiteshvara state. Uh, similarly, here, the point being made here is that all the other various practices that one needs to cultivate, they are all uh, ultimately aimed at cu cultivating this great compassion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Karaslan, 
So um, we read for the actual cultivation of compassion. So we read in the text which says this was on this is on page two, uh, 49, the English translation. We read the way to meditate on compassion will be taught from the outside outset. 
begin the practice by meditating on equanimity and so on. So here, um, Kamala Sheila is presenting the actual, the, you know, procedure for cultivating great compassion. So generally, um, as I mentioned yesterday in my public talk, um, my own understanding is that when we talk about compassion, compassion is a natural quality that we all possess. And in fact, at that level, we can view compassion to be a biological product. So <clears throat> something that has a special role, its own unique role to play in our own day-to-day -day life. And in fact, when we talk about the roles of these mental states, even on the physical level, we can understand different functions, the various elements of that phenomena place. For example, if you look at a plant such as flower, the flower um, has a certain mechanism within it that ensure its survival. So for example, when it needs water, there is a mechanism that help kind of, you know, attract water and absorb water. Uh, it needs uh, sunlight for its uh, survival and growth. It has certain mechanism built in it, which enables it to attract the sunlight. And uh, similarly, when it, you know, if it is exposed to too powerful a wind, in order to make sure that it doesn't break, there's a certain flexibility. And in fact, if you look at the plants that grow in a very windy area, you will notice that the trees and the plants that tend to grow in the windy areas have a special quality of being very flexible so that they don't snap you know, because of the strong force of wind. Similarly, if you look at plants that grow in a very dry area where the water is really scarce, then these plants... <laughs> ガロジョベロドネシンニジュルジジ。ね、やっ、ちゅちゅじゃ、かそれ。いや、ね、どうぞ、ちょうで。シンニジュルジュと。こう見て、ガロジョあるや。かん、かん、ほんまた。うん、
those factors that are necessary for the survival. And there must be also mental states that enable the individual to ward off any uh, potential obstacles that obstruct and, and undermine the, the flourishing of, of the individual. So within the mental state, we can see different forces. So for example, if we look at our own mental states, uh, it, it is very natural for us to have, you know, feel attachment towards the whom we love and to feel kind of, you know, hostile towards those that threaten us. So this is a very natural mechanism at the mental level that we all possess. And it, in fact, it ensures our survival. But the problem is when our attachment goes too excessive, then it becomes dysfunctional. Uh, and similarly, when this aversion becomes too excessive, again, it becomes dysfunctional. But in themselves, they have a, a, a natural role to play to help us attract the conditions necessary and to dispel, to, to protect us against obstacles that might undermine our well-being. So what is happening, and, and this is, I would see this as a biological product, we have this mechanism. So compassion is part of that mechanism that we possess biologically. Uh, so what is in, you know, um, you know, involved here when we uh, cultivate compassion, and the aim here is to ensure that within the emotion or the mental states that attract things to us, we retain that, that element which is attracted to others, but without the uh, falling into the, the, um, the influence of the grasping and the clinging element. Normally when we experience attachment, there is a sense of attraction to the object, but also there is a very strong clinging and a grasping element. So in a compassion meditation, we are, while ensuring that we retain this sense of connectedness and attraction, yet at the same time reduce the the influence of this grasping and clinging element. Similarly, with relation to aversion, uh, while retaining this function of protecting us against the obstacles, we are trying to ensure that our mind does not fall, you know, victim to this element of hostility that that kind of you know uh, feel averse towards others. So this is what is involved in the actual cultivation of compassion. And uh, in the text here, um, the key elements that are uh, introduced for cultivating compassion are two. One is a deeper understanding of the nature of suffering that we wish others to be free of. And the second element is cultivating um, uh, a sense of um, holding others to be dear, a sense of connectedness, affection towards others and holding others to be dear. So these are the two key elements that are being cultivated towards cultivating compassion. So this takes us to the actual method of cultivating compassion uh, on the basis of the seven point cause and effect uh, instruction. So here, the, the actual... So the actual practice uh, proceeds with first laying the basis by cultivating a sense of equanimity towards all beings and then it moves on to the first stage which is uh, cultivating the recognition of all beings as having been one's mother without any exception and then on that basis one cultivates the um, the recognition of the need to, sorry, the recognition of the kindness, a recollection of the kindness of uh, other, all beings, and then on that basis, uh, cultivating the awareness of the need to repay their kindness, and which he, on the basis of which one cultivates uh, affectionate love or um, loving kindness in the form of holding others to be dear, 
and which then uh, uh, results in the cultivation of great compassion. So it is in this way uh, the actual meditation on compassion is presented. Oh yeah. That's the name. Sorry. So it is in this proce- uh, pr- uh, procedure, the, the processes for uh, cultivating this uh, sense of holding others, sense of affection, holding others to be dear, that is um, cultivated. So you remember that there were two elements. One was understanding of the suffering. The other one was the sense of affection for others that hold others to be dear. ตาตุเมสัมยาติตาตะละอันตะเตเอ่อเชนติงตุเมสัมยาติสุนตัวตะเนละเตละเอ่อตะเนละนอระตะเตละยาเนละเอ่อโลละจิเกเกนุบะโ
那所就是这个大张扛到大王眼吧那么那所行行为就是这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个
uh, there are some important phrases. For example, it talks about how um, we are under the power of causes characterized by uh, karmic actions and afflictions. And then um, Kamala Shila says it has the nature and characteristics of momentary disintegration. So um, what is pointing out is that given that it is a conditioned phenomena, um, it is subject to momentary change. And, um, and this momentariness uh, indicates it's being totally um, conditioned by its own causes and conditions. And here the causes and conditions refer primarily to the karmic actions, karma and the afflictions. And that is what makes the very existence a form of suffering. And this is what, this is the meaning of pervasive uh, condition, uh, suffering of pervasive conditioning. Mm, yeah. Then, Combrachene, Sendita so in the text, um, Kamala Sheila, having explained the process by which uh, one cultivates great compassion, then he uh, explains how one then can go on and cultivate uh, loving kindness. So we read in, uh, on page 67 uh, where he writes, meditation on loving kindness begins with friends and people you are fond of. It has the nature of wishing that they meet with happiness and, and so on. And uh, so then he goes on to write that habituating yourself to compassion you will gradually generate a spontaneous wish to liberate all sentient beings. Um, so what he's uh, explaining here is that um, you know, when you have cultivated compassion, then a genuine wish to bring about others' welfare uh, arises, and the others' welfare really refers to the f liberation of all beings, because when you seek others' welfare, you seek others to be free from suffering. So, uh, so the genuine wish to bring about others' liberation will arise. And this serves as the basis. And um, since one cannot bring about others' welfare if one's own welfare has not been uh, achieved, therefore the genuine wish to attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings arises. So in this way, the Buddhachitta, the awakening mind, arises. So, and awakening mind is characterized as an aspiration to attain Buddhahood, which is endowed with two aspirations. One is the aspiration to bring about others' welfare, which is uh, compassion being heart of it. And the other aspiration is the actual wish for attaining Buddhahood for their sake. So, um, so he writes, therefore, having familiarized yourself with compassion as the basis, meditate on the awakening mind of Buddhachitta. So in this context, um, the, the, the phrase, the expressions that one find in um, um, the um, 
um, Vimukti Sena's um, commentary on the 25,000 uh, lines on the perfection of wisdom uh, makes sense when he says that it is, uh, it is with compassion one focuses on the sentient beings and it is with um, wisdom one focuses, to on, uh, one focuses on Buddhahood, attainment of enlightenment. Yeah, so so, and then we read uh, in the text on page 67 um, where Kamala Shila says that this awakening mind is of two types, conventional and the ultimate. And the conventional awakening mind is the cultivation of the initial thought that aspires to attain unsurpassable and perfectly consummated Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. Um, and then here... Um, uh, Kamala Shila is again t making a dis uh, talking about the two primary forms of awakening mind, the aspiring awakening mind and engaging awakening mind, and the distinctions between the two are explained here. The aspiring awakening mind refers to the initial stage when you simply cultivate the awakening um, mind at the level of aspiration, and then the second level of bodhicitta is explained here which says that after having taken the vow out of compassion to release all sentient beings from suffering, so on the basis of aspiration, when one it, you know, takes the bodhisattva vows and then engages in the bodhisattva deeds, from that point onwards, uh, one has attained the engaging awakening mind. So uh, we will now leave our Kamala Shila text at that. Um, so... So the actual um, the aspiring awakening mind and engaging awakening mind are the two main forms of awakening mind and the reference to the conventional awakening mind and, and um, uh, ultimate awakening mind is more in the, uh, in the sense of uh, um, um, where the term awakening mind is applied to the ultimate awakening mind. That's mm -hmm. So we will now read from Shantideva's text. So we read at the beginning, um, it reads, the text opens with the title. In Sanskrit, um, this text is called Bodhisattva Charya Avatara, and in English, uh, Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. And um, um, it also uh, has a salutation. Um, uh, I pay homage to the Buddhas and all the Buddhasattvas, all the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. Mm. Chanju Tandai 
So uh, the title of the text is Bodhisattva Charya Avatar, um, Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. And in fact, the title indicates very clearly the subject matter of this particular text. And um, so uh, here it refers to the Bodhisattva's way of life. And um, the, um, the Bodhisattva literally means um, those whose mind is turned towards awakening or enlightenment. And uh, so the Sanskrit term for enlightenment is Bodhi, um, and uh, the Tibetan term is Changchub. And the Sanskrit term has the connotation of cleansing and purifying and also uh, um, embodiment of knowledge or comprehension. And however, in the Tibetan, when the term bodhi was translated, both these two key meanings of the term were brought together into a single composite uh, word. So the Tibetan term changjub carries both connotations of the term. So chang uh, refers to uh, purification and cleansing, and chup refers to realization. So therefore, chang chup um, refers to the two main uh, key qualities of the Buddhahood. One is the quality, qualifi- the quality of having eliminated all the uh, stains, and the other uh, refers to the quality of all the perfection of all the realizations. And um, so, and the and the unexcelled form. Uh, state of this enlightenment is the Buddhahood. So Buddhahood is the great enlightenment. And uh, so Bodhisattvas are beings who aspire, whose mind is turned towards the attainment of that state. So, and, and so, so similarly in Tibetan, um, when the term Buddha was translated, um, the Sanskrit term Buddha again has two key connotations, uh, Sangba, uh, means to be awakened, and geba means to flourish. Uh, and uh, however, in Tibetan, um, again, the, these lotawas, these translators were very skilled in what they were doing, and they were able to create another composite word that would capture both the connotations of the term. So the Tibetan term sangye has the connotation of both being awakened f- from the uh, uh, awakened and also having all the realizations and qualities, uh, you know, flourished. Um, so, and then way of life here, uh, or Bodhisattva deeds, uh, refer to, um, you know, um, different stages. For example, there is the, the deed in the form of entering into the Bodhisattva path, and this refers to the initial cultivation of the awakening mind, Bodhicitta, and then the actual practices of the deeds, which are constituted by the six perfections, and then the, the resultant state of these uh, deeds, which is the attainment of Buddhahood. So when the text refers to Bodhisattva's way of life, this way of life phrase uh, contains uh, the initial stage of entering into the path, the actual path itself, and the resultant state of uh, Buddhahood as well, which represents the fulfillment of one's own 
uh, aims and the interest of other certain beings as well. So then the so then the first stanza, um, which reads reverently bowing to the sugadas who are endowed with the dhammakaya, together with their children and all who are worthy of veneration. So that um, is the, the the verse of homage, paying homage, and then this is followed by a pledge to compose the text, which read, I shall. Con con concisely present a guide to the discipline of the children of the Sugathas in accordance with the scriptures. So, um, the author, uh, Shantideva, is saying that uh, he shall present it in accordance with the scriptures to emphasize the point that it's not something that he's creating himself, making it up. Um, but then the question could be raised, if it has already been presented in the sutras, scriptures, then wouldn't it be a repetition? So then in response, he's saying that he's presenting in, in a concise form. So therefore, it's not a repetition. He's pr presenting what has been present, taught in the scriptures in a more concise form. Didn't um, Deva in fact composed um, another important text dealing with the same topic known as the Compendium of Training, Shiksha Samuchaya. And in fact, it seems that he composed Shiksha Samuchaya, the Compendium of Training, first, and then the Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life after. Um, <coughs> and uh, there is also another text attributed to Shantideva, a Compendium of Scriptures, which does not exist in the Tinguru collection of the Tibetan canon. And um, however, um, these two texts, uh, compendium of training and Shantideva's guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life. Um, there was a tradition in Tibet as part of the Kadam exposition of the six main Indian classics of the Kadam school. Uh, there was a tradition to present a combined explanation of these two texts, uh, the compendium of training and guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life. And this, I think, is very significant because if you read the two texts together, um, it becomes clear that those uh, topics which Shantideva explains in great detail in Shiksha Samuchaya are uh, explained in a very brief, succinct forms in uh, Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. And those that are explained extensively in Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life are explained very briefly in Shiksha Samuchaya. So therefore, it seems that it is quite important to try to read these two, two texts together, uh, side by side. Oh, yeah. That's why I'm going to go to the 
这里的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人
to be able to serve as the basis for the arising of awakening mind. And um, <clears throat> so the reference is to the human existence, which is very important because since the cultivation of bodhicitta, awakening mind, and attainment of Buddhahood really requires the application of the human intelligence in its most kind of, you know, um, uh, advanced form and potential. And so the hu human existence accords us with, with the mental and the physical ca capacity that enables us to utilize our intelligence. So therefore, um, uh, Shantideva was pointing out that this is the most ideal physical existence that uh, would serve as the basis for the arising of bodhicitta. No, Chu Tell um, then in stanza um, six, um, Shantideva explains the rarity of the arising of virtuous qualities in us, mental states in us, and uh, in fact, they're according to oral uh, tradition, sometimes uh, the metaphor is used which contrasts the frequency with which virtuous mental states in, arises in us as opposed to non-virtuous mental states. And the oral tradition, uh, the metaphor that is used is that, um, you know, the arising of virtuous mental states in us is like someone trying to push a huge boulder up the hill, whereas arising of non-virtuous mental states in us is very similar to a boulder freely rushing down, down the hill. And um, so, and in a sense, we can understand it by, uh, this by relating to our own personal experience. We consider ourselves to be Dharma practitioners. We are familiar with um, um, the kind of the morality of what is right and what is wrong. We have some ability to distinguish between virtues as opposed to non-virtuous actions. Even then, despite all of this awareness and familiarity, we often find ourselves sliding more, you know, more towards the non-virtuous mental states. If that is the case, then imagine what would be the situation for many others who just do not have that kind of dharma awareness. So, then, however, so we can relate that to our own personal existence. For example, in one of our previous lives, we may have uh, had an exist form of existence where we were totally, uh, we uh, did not meet with the Dharma. Uh, we were ignorant of the, the norms of 
morality, what is right and what is wrong, the ethical norms, and uh, our uh, kind of eyes of intelligence were, you know, um, uh, blinded by ignorance. And so in those kind of states of existence, imagine what the situation would have been like. Uh, and then Shantideva, but however, goes on to explain that though uh, uh, rare it is for us to have virtuous mental states in us, however, uh, there is one factor if we can cultivate within us that will ensure that even the tiniest degree of a virtuous mental state becomes uh, a factor for uh, a, you know, attainment of fulfillment of the two accumulations of wisdom and merit so that this virtue remains you know, long term and, and this is the bodhicitta, the awakening mind. So if even it may be a very feeble you know, wholesome action, so long as it is sustained by awakening mind, it will ensure that this feeble, you know, wholesome uh, action uh, becomes a co condition for the attainment of Buddhahood, for the fulfillment of the two accumulations. So, and, and he said, so what this is suggesting here is that if you compare that to other forms of virtuous activity, if it is not motivated by Bodhicitta, but rather motivated by quest for personal liberation and on that basis one may have you know uh, cultivated uh, one may have meditated on say for example emptiness for you know lifetimes and so on um, though however powerful that virtue might be uh, but compared to uh, a, a virtue that is sustained by um, even a feeble virtue that is sustained by bodhicitta that virtue that is sustained by bodhicitta is much more powerful and, and long-term. So, um, and, and this, of course, it makes sense because uh, of the expansiveness of the state of mind and the motivation that underlies the you know, cultivation of bodhicitta, the awakening mind, as Nagarjuna uh, points out in his Precious Garland, where he identifies uh, three, four uh, immeasurable uh, factors um, and with relation to bodhisattva's practices, he talks about how um, the, the bodhisattva's compassion and bodhicitta is uh, directed towards an uh, immeasurable number of sentient beings. Um, it is aimed at the attainment of immeasurable number of qualities of the Buddha, and uh, it involves the cultivation of uh, immeasurable numbers of training, and also uh, it involves a sense of dedication to engaging in these practices for inf you know, immeasurable uh, length of time. And because of these four factors that are immeasurable, that makes uh, any virtue that is sustained by bodhicitta as being very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Gero <laughs> Shumbusai, Today, 
So, uh, in fact, if you look at um, the meaning of, or if you try to understand what is the essence of Dharma practice, the essence of Dharma practice is to um, uh, cultivate um, virtues or wholesome mental states where the mental states has an arisen, and also to to further develop and enhance those wholesome mental states or virtuous mental states that has already arisen and, and enhance them you know, further. And also, um, the, the essence of Dharma practice is to um, ensure that the negative uh, or non-virtuous mental states do not arise where it hasn't arisen yet, and to undermine the force of those me negative mental states that has already arisen so in other words, the essence of the Dharma practice is to uh, purify the negative mental states and cultivate the virtuous, wholesome mental states and enhance and develop them. So if that is the case, then you know, by simply cultivating bodhicitta, the mind, awakening mind alone, we will be able to accomplish all of these aims. We, with the cultivation of bodhicitta, we will be able to accumulate all the merits and the wholesome mental states with the cultivation of bodhicitta will be able to eliminate all the uh, negative mental states and, and unwholesome mental states with, uh, it, with bodhicitta will be able to ensure the uh, perfection of the two accumulations of merit and wisdom and so um, and, and also in this way um, with the practice of bodhicitta, we will be able to come to uh, recognize that we will make our human existence meaningful and purposeful because you can feel, yes, I've made my life purposeful and meaningful. And uh, so, so bodhicitta also enables us to cleanse and purify all the obscurations, both afflictions and their propensities. Um, it also help us uh, accumulate and increase our merits. Uh, this is also the most effective practice that you know, enables us to please all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and make offerings to them through our practice. And, um, and, and uh, so therefore, as practitioners, we need to uh, cultivate the determination that, you know, whatever, come what may, um, whether I'm uh, uh, enjoying a success in my life, I will continue to practice bodhicitta. Whether I'm confronting or facing tragedy and adversities, I will still practice bodhicitta. And so, and it is bodhicitta that will enable us to fulfill our own self-interest and also bring about others' interest and others' welfare as well. So, and it, therefore, it is a very powerful practice that, for example, when you are enjoying success and greater fortune in your life, Buddhist, it is the practice of bodhicitta that will ensure that you, this doesn't slide into a form of arrogance and conceit. And similarly, when you are you know, facing adversities and misfortune in your life, it will be bodhicitta that will protect you so that you don't slide into a form of becoming demoralizing and losing uh, hope and, and so on. So an amazing thing is that if you look at bodhicitta, although there is a tremendous amount of courage underlying the bodhicitta, but there is no sense of self-importance. There is no sense of conceitedness. And similarly, in, the, you know, in someone who has the bodhicitta, although that person relates to all other sentient beings as superior and sees himself or herself as kind of you know, being inferior to others, but at the same time, there is a tremendous degree of self-confidence in that state of mind. So you can see that Bodhicitta, if you understand it, it is truly an amazing state of mind. So, uh, therefore, we read in stanza number seven, Shantideva writes, uh, the Lord of the Sages, who have been contemplating for many eons, have seen this alone as a blessing by which joy is easily increased and immeasurable multitudes of beings are rescued.
Sanji Jum then they get dumb by Yonaman at the Chanju Simrisha. No. Sanji Jum then they get dumb by Yonaman at the Chanju Simrisha. So, in fact, the most um, precious or, or the, uh, the best instruction and that the, you know, of the Buddha Shakyamuni really is the instruction on Buddha Chitta, the awakening mind. So in fact, uh, Buddha Chitta, the awakening mind, is the heart of the instructions of all the Buddhas of past, present, and future. So, uh, so it's leaving aside Buddha Chitta practice and then asking for some other instruction actually is, is mistaken. So some people, you know, request for some ear whispered instruction. <laughs> so those who ask for instruction such as ear to ear whispered, some secret instruction, you know, setting aside Buddhicitta, clearly uh, demonstrated they haven't fully understood properly the, uh, the ignorance. Um, ignorance. Uh, so they were ignorant. So therefore, uh, our <laughs> attitude should be such that uh, the, you know, with full of determination that um, you know, while you know, while I'm alive, it is Buddhicitta, and at the point of death, it will be Buddhicitta, and uh, whether I'm uh, enjoying success and good fortune in my life, it will be Buddhicitta. Whether I'm enjoying Misfortune and facing adversities, it will be Buddha, it is Bodhicitta. So, in a way, actually, uh, one of the hard uh, kind of you know activity or practice of ordinary beings is to tender, tend after our loved ones and uh, to take care for, of our loved ones and then, you know, take care of our enemies. Um, so if that is the case, then, uh, you know, focus on bodhicitta practice because the bodhicitta practice will ensure that you will be successful even in that task as well. Ah, yeah. So, I'll stop. Finish. Uh, now, good night. Good night. See you again tomorrow. No,
read um, in Shantideva's text, he says, in the light of this, people are seen to be of two types, the contemplative and the ordinary person. The ordinary folks are superseded by the contemplatives. And then he goes on, due to the difference in their intelligence, even contemplatives are refuted by successively higher ones by means of analogies accepted by both parties. And the point being made here is that when two perspectives come into you know, contact with each other and debate about a certain fact of reality, they, that, that kind of discourse takes place on the basis of certain shared premises, and you also use examples that are you know, accepted by both parties, and on that basis, the discourse takes place. So with this, <clears throat> um, I just wanted to read that section of Shantideva's chapter to provide an overall introduction to the overall framework of the Buddhist path. Mm. はい、だ。だじゃな。うん。ああ。だけなんだ。なんしゅぎ。え。シザルで。ちょっとね、ごまごま3 ตัดเต็มไปชิติกระสุนบริสตมนะตัดตรงเนี่ยเต็มไปกุจุเต็มไปชิติกุนเดชิไอ้นี่กอบไปตะบาลาเจเต็มไปชิติกุนเดชิส
Um, so we will carry on from our reading of Shantideva's text, chapter 9, um, <coughs> we are on uh, verse 2, uh, where we read that this truth is recognized as being of two kinds, conventional and ultimate. And then Shantideva goes on to write, ultimate reality is, the, is beyond the scope of the intellect. The intellect is called conventional reality. So we already spoke about how we can understand the two levels of the truth in terms of the facts that are affirmed and found by a conventional mode of understanding and the more ultimate mode of understanding. So corresponding to these two levels of understanding with respect to reality, one can talk about two levels of truth. <clears throat> and then um, the text goes on to write, in the light of this, people are seen to be of two types, the contemplative or the yogi and the ordinary person. So um, the reference, um, the point being made here is that among individuals, there will be different types and the distinctions are drawn on the basis of the level of sophistication in their understanding of reality. So comparatively, for example, we can... That is the change the sound of the Buddhist science and Buddhist philosophy or Buddhist concept and Buddhist religion. So the, the, the foundation of the Buddha's teaching uh, are really uh, embodied in the teachings of the Four Noble Truths. And um, so this is the Four Noble Truths where Buddha presents, in fact, two sets of cause and effect relations. So you have the suffering and its origin, one set of cause and effect, a cessation and the path, another set of cause and effects. And when, if you look at the, the Buddha's actual sermon on the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha taught Four Noble Truths by means of three repetitions or three cycles. One was um, the, <clears throat> the presentation of the truth themselves. So where Buddha states that this is, uh, is the truth of suffering, this is the truth of the origin of suffering, and so on. So at that level, you know, Buddha is presenting the nature of reality. <clears throat> and, um, and, you know, and then the second uh, round of presentation where Buddha says that suffering must be recognized and the origin of suffering must be eliminated and the cessation must be actualized and the path must be cultivated. So here, Buddha is presenting now um, the function <coughs> of these knowledge of the Four Noble Truths and how one should implement that knowledge into one's actual practice. So in other words, in this second round of repetition, presentation, Buddha is presenting 
<coughs> the, the procedural on the path. And uh, so in the third round of presentation, when the Buddha said that uh, although suffering must be known, recognized, but there is no suffering to be recognized, although the origin must be eliminated, there is no origin to be eliminated, and so on. So in this <coughs> um, uh, round of presentation, Buddha is presenting the actual uh, results or fruits of internalizing the knowledge of the Four Noble Truths and implementing them into their proper functions. So here, the, 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 the fruit of the knowledge of the Four Noble Truths and the implementation is the <coughs> uh, realization of the wisdom of um, uh, cessation and also uh, non-arising. Now this refers to the cessation of the suffering and the non-arising of suffering anymore. And uh, so in, in commenting upon this uh, fruits of the etern, uh, internalization of the knowledge of the Four Noble Truths, uh, Nagarjuna in his precious garland explains that to fully understand the meaning of cessation and also non-arising of potential suffering, uh, one must understand it in terms of the, the teaching on emptiness, the emptiness of inherent existence. And, <clears throat> and, and the reason for that is because when we talk about the cessation of suffering, we are also talking about the cessation of the roots of suffering. And the root of suffering is this distorted state of mind. Uh, and the question is, in what sense the root of the suffering is distorted? It is distorted in relation to the actual nature of reality. So since the root of suffering is a distorted state of mind uh, with relation to the actual nature of reality, it is a state of mind that can be eliminated and the cessation of that can be actualized. So, and since it is distorted in relation to the ultimate nature of reality, it, by cultivating the wisdom that under talk about ordinary people, beings, and the more contemplative on the basis of those who, for example, um, are concerned only about everyday life and their understanding of the events around them are more at this very gross everyday engagement with the world. So we can call that perspective an ordinary perspective and contrast that with those individuals are, who are, are more reflective, whose understanding and engagement with the world may include you know, un, the concepts about what happens after the life, after the death, the concept of rebirth and so on. So, and those who tend to take more reflective kind of, you know, approach to their own internal mental states and so on. So comparatively, we can call one group of people more contemplative or yogi, the other kind of more ordinary. So even within the ordinary perspective, we can find differences, again, comparatively. For example, if you compare the scientist to average ordinary person, then again, we can say that the scientists tend to have a perspective that is not satisfied only with a mere superficial perception of the world. They would inquire deeper into what constitutes reality over and above, beyond the level of perception, beyond the level of everyday appearance. So again, within that context, we can say the scientists represent more the yogi or contemplative perspective and the average ordinary person as representing the ordinary perspective. And the Tibetan term for yogi is naljor, and Neljuro literally means connecting your mind to a more settled facts of things. So in that sense, that, that etymology can also apply to the scientific perspective, which tends to relate to reality at a more deeper level. So in any case here, in this text, the distinction between the yogi and the ordinary perspective is really made on the basis of whether or not one's perspective is only confined to this world, this life, or whether the perspective includes something beyond the boundaries of this life, such as concept of rebirth and so on. So, um, and also uh, within, um, so, so ordinary people, for example, when we relate to the world, we tend to relate on the level of, you know, everyday uh, perspective. So, for example, when we see this flower today, which we have seen yesterday, instinctively we tend to think 
This is the same flower I saw yesterday. So on that gross level, we can use that kind of language. But if you go beyond that and analyze, then actually this is, in, in a strict sense, this is not the same flower. Because the flower, being a conditioned phenomenon, is momentarily changing. So the flower, the yesterday's flower is no longer here. But on an ordinary kind of naive perspective, we tend to relate, you know, take this flower to be the same flower. Because what is happening is that we relate to this flower through the medium of the concept of flower, which conflates time. And we tend to, you know, you know bring, make, mix the two times together and turn it into one entity. But so that's the ordinary perspective. Whereas the yogic perspective tends to look more at a deeper level of the actual reality. So within the yogis, again, depending upon how profound your understanding of the nature of reality, that perspective is going to be more advanced compared to other perspectives that are less deeper in their engagement with the reality. So even within the yogic perspective, contemplative perspective, there can be different levels. So therefore, we. Tatigan, Tell Mizitaka 
Nangsu zamra chama sha ba che ne su khan de shito jik shim ju che deng e. Ta di di ko ya tan tan namal jorwa. Nan jor sa di. Si di yu zan e ko ya tan nan jor sa ha che. Do su tan jor nan jor sa ha che ko ko chou ro ba. So ta nan jor ba ta pe ba. Ni ni chung 